Hi, I'm Tom Burrell, and I want to share with you a brief documentary film that I produced celebrating and commemorating the 75th birthday of a very special person, a person who also happens to be the love of my life, or I might say <laughs> the life of my love. Uh, I hope you find this story to be enlightening, inspirational, and entertaining, worth telling and sharing. Because Madeline has had so much to contend with in her own life, I think it's made her a deeply compassionate and caring person. She has this ability to move beyond trials and tribulations and put those things behind her and basically move forward. We live there on the top, that bay window yeah. at the very top is where Grandma sat. That's right. That's right. It was my grandmother who told me I was special, that God had something special in mind for me. I was the pride of my grandparents who primarily raised me. My mother was 17 when I was born and my father was 19 premature parents, hardly able to take on the responsibility of parenting. And my father was very handsome and um, a womanizer. That was something that was known by everyone. It was interesting to have him in such close proximity, but not in my life. And in that way, I was a little bit of an outsider. Bed-Stuy during that period was the hub of affluent African Americans. They were mailmen, school teachers. My grandmother was a domestic, but my mother was a secretary for Girl Scouts of America. Everybody went to church. People wanted to know when they met you what church you belonged to. Grandma had us in church, not just on Sunday, but several days through the week. Reverend Milton Glamison, who was our pastor, taught me some things that uh, were long lasting. I remember one day I was being teased, bullied at school, and I came crying, you know, to him. And he, he told me about the, the parable of turning the other cheek, and that turning the other cheek simply means taking a second look. And that's, that was a lasting lesson that allowed me to not have a hair trigger response to things. Midge was my first friend. Midge was the kind of person that she was very outgoing and funny, and she liked to take charge. And she had a way of involving everyone in what she was doing. And people gravitated to her. There was a group of friends. We called ourselves the Les Bon Amis, the good friends. But the boys on the block, seeing us as snooty little girls, they called us the Bony Knees. And we would meet on Friday nights at one of our houses, and we would, it was all girls, and we would just come together and and be silly, actually. Living in a neighborhood where there was different colored people, it was difficult. Shadism was really at play very much in Bed-Stuy then. Um, the lighter skinned people had the bigger houses. The domestics, like my grandmother, who was dark, had a harder time, were not as readily accepted. My mother-in-law was a brown-skinned lady, and Connie was a brown-skinned girl. And a lot of people felt that I married a white man because he was so fair. So there were people who were lighter than a paper bag and darker than the paper bag. I was paper bag color, 
and so I could stride uh, both worlds to a certain extent. I was discovering that there was something different about my learning, and it wasn't until college that I learned it was dyslexia. But it was my inability to read. I thought can't read meant can't succeed. And so between the broken home and being a slow learner, that, that was a challenge early on that I think allowed me to build some resilience in other ways. I had to charm people. I very early on as a teenager started waiting on tables. And one day my father came into the restaurant with a trail of beautiful women behind him. And he sat in my booth and my knees began to quake. And so I found myself saying, uh, can I take your order, Mr. Ward? And he said, oh, you know me, huh? And they turned to the lady next to him, Ophelia, and said, all the pretty girls know me. And uh, so I said, yes, I know you because you're my father. And uh, he went absolutely blank. And uh, he got up, put on his coat and hat, and walked out the door. Never saw him again for years. My mother had a premature demise. She was 36 years old. She had recently remarried and had two children. Their romance was legendary in the neighborhood. So when she died so suddenly, he was absolutely devastated and started drinking. And I was just graduating from high school and I was taken absolutely by surprise. My grandmother, who had raised me, died a year after my mother died. I think it broke her heart that her daughter had died. And so it was a double tragedy for me because there was no one. It was very difficult being with an alcoholic and two babies. And my plans were to go to college and to do things. But as it uh, occurred, her dying wish was for me to take care of the children. And that was a yoke that I carried. After my mother passed, my sister was constantly, you know, in doing what she could do to try to take care of me and my sister. And it was, it was something that clearly shaped my entire life. Um, there were things that I would wish for them uh, that I couldn't provide because I was too young and didn't know how. The sense of responsibility is something hard to shake. My time with her was valuable uh, to me because those were the only time I felt like there was, there was somebody that genuinely, that I genuinely had a connection to, that genuinely cared. She always had a way of taking, you know, those hard moments and turning it into opportunities. So while, you know, it may seem like, oh God, what did you just do? Hmm, let's look at that for a minute. How can we turn this and make it into something better? But there was a point where she had to decide to move on and do the things that she needed to do for herself. Drawing was always a part of my life and creativity was my ticket to acceptance. I had an uncle who was an artist and he would make these little books for me. His name is Clayton, Clayton Mosley. He sent me to the Art Students League. He really felt I had a gift in terms of artistic talent. Preston Rock was a family friend who was visiting on his way to the airport to go to the fair that was happening in Greece. Preston stopped by and he opened his portfolio and showed me drawings uh, of buildings, of products, of a host of things that it had never occurred to me that someone has to design each of these things. And uh, I asked him what it was, and he says, I'm an industrial designer. And when I saw the world that he was about to step into, I was absolutely enthralled. 
That little visit changed my life. I eventually found my way to New York University Parsons School of Design, where an industrial design program had me as the only African American. Grandma used to always say, you remember, be a credit to your race now. And so that's what uh, I tried to do. But it was there that it was discovered that in fact I was dyslexic. Knowing that dyslexia was not a curse, but uh, that it was something that I could deal with, something that I could leverage as a matter of fact because with that came the ability to see things other people weren't seeing. And that was like an albatross being lifted off me. I felt I could accomplish anything. My dad had remarried, and one day he showed up at my door with his new wife and his son. And that's the beginning of our wonderful relationship. I mean, I must have been about four or five went downtown, my father and mother and I, met Madeline there, and somebody called me over and says, Jerry, we want to um, uh, introduce you to this person. Uh, this is your sister. And I was pretty much great. And then I went around looking at the rest of the apartment. Uh, <laughs> Madeline was always loving and uh, outreaching. And uh, Madeline was actually phenomenal in arranging for assisted care living you know, for him and staying very close. Yeah, I think it was a very rich period uh, for Madeline and my dad. It was at Parsons School of Design that I was then recruited by Henry Dreyfus Industrial Design and my career was off and running. It was an exciting time. It was when manufacturers went to industrial designers in order to fashion their products. I was chosen to be part of a team that did airplanes, sewing machines, the Polaroid camera. I designed automotive interiors and John Deere tractors. We did the snowmobile for American Machine and Foundry, and we did telephones of all sorts for Bell Labs. When uh, Henry Dreyfus was doing the Symbol Dictionary, he relied on my uh, ability to instantaneously look at something to see whether or not it was telling the right story. I felt particularly vindicated for my dyslexia. I was hired by Yankee Plastic to design plastic hangers and also design the tools for making the hangers. And these were like pennies a piece. And it was a cost saving and it was a bonus that the consumer got when they bought the garment. I literally traveled around the world. Wherever I went, where there were street vendors, there was the plastic hanger. Who would have thought it? I was always the only woman, the only person of color. And so I wasn't undaunted, but it was lonely. But there was such a learning there for me that uh, continued to repeat itself and helped me to use my difference as an advantage and interpret it that way. Addison is the industrial designer right. in the firm, in the, in the family. In the family, in the in the family, family firm. And soon in the firm. <laughs> uh, he builds the most incredible cars, yeah. cameras. What else, Addison? What else do you build? He builds like... Flying machines. Yeah. Flying machines. And I asked you, what did you want for your birthday? And you said, a hoverboard. And I said, where do you get it? And you said, I haven't designed it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what your father says? He says that you are many me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that we look alike, we think alike, and we act alike. Yeah. Is it? I think something? so. Me is the dancer. And we certainly know that Amma has some some dancing chops. <laughs>
<laughs> the best design I ever did, my son. My parents both decided to put me at the center when they decided to split. Uh, so they made sure that they lived only a couple of blocks from each other. They made a commitment to make sure that I always had a sense of love and amicability between the two of them. Having uh, a son who was extraordinary from day one and still is, is one of the blessings of that union and of my life. He was five years old by the time I tried to resume my career. But the industry had moved past all of the stuff that I was expert in. It pushed me in the direction of being an entrepreneur. First of all, I think entrepreneurism is part of our tradition as black women. But for me, it, it happened after I had trained my third boss to be my boss, I realized that it was time for me to, in fact, consider uh, becoming a business owner. All of my background and training in design uh, and a, a master's in writing prepared me uh, to launch more creative. I began to recognize that it was the marketers rather than the designers that decided the fate of a product. I wanted to have a voice in a way that took a position that women really had power and influence in the marketplace that they were not using. Doors were just opening. That's how it felt, that there was nothing that I could not achieve. New York Downtown Hospital is probably the only time in my life I will ever have had the opportunity to rename a hospital. It was Beekman Hospital. The front door always opened on Chinatown, and the back door exited into Wall Street. So I changed the front door to being Wall Street, and I renamed it, repositioned it, rebranded it as New York Downtown Hospital. And it came back like gangbusters. Meet the woman who won the first post-apartheid contract with South Africa. She's also a leader in advertising aimed at African Americans. The Sister City program was between the Big Apple and Johannesburg. Mandela was just being released. The leader of the African National Congress, Nelson Mandela, left Victor Foster prison outside Cape Town a free man for the first time for 27 years. And so the idea of selling South African products here and American products there as a way of opening some of the conversation culturally was a good one. Giuliani arranged for a reception and I shook hands with the man who had the softest hands I have ever felt in the world. And he was soft-spoken, and um, just a, one of those moments, inspirational moment. New York was under a lot of stress. There were shootings. There were people that seemed to hate each other. Madeline and I were on the board of the police department working together towards courtesy, professionalism, and respect. And people saw the spark that it engendered where people wanted to be courteous and somehow often didn't know how. The emphasis was always on how can we make New York a friendlier, safer, more stellar. It was, it was dangerous in Central Park. I was always looking for what next, what can I do next to make a difference. Madeline helped create a far better understanding between the police department and the local communities. I give her credit for conceiving that, for implementing that, and to this day, um, that impact is being felt. I had distinguished myself as someone who knew how to speak with a cultural script, and so it became 
something that I was able to wed to my product design, my industrial design. The Essence Eyewear Division was a licensing agreement to create eyewear for African Americans. We didn't know anything about eyewear, and we knew that we needed someone who could really advance the project. And so we reached out to Madeline Moore. African Americans have wider bridges and temples, uh, and so this was designed, I designed this one, um, to accommodate that larger face. And that's what the whole Essence collection was. So it was a challenge to get Iris stores to carry Essence because they didn't believe there was a big enough market. But once we put them out, they couldn't keep them in stock. It was really stunning and exciting and opened the way for other licensing opportunities for Essence because of what she gave to us. It was a week of sounds and sights, sand and sea, socializing, meeting, greeting, and playing with people from all over the country. 700 business, political, and community leaders aboard a massive Royal Caribbean cruise ship sailing from Miami to Haiti to Jamaica to Cozumel. A friend had invited me to come and visit them in Indiana. I said, let's meet someplace in the middle and um, came up with the idea of a cruise. And so we started off with 25, and then the next year it was close to 100, and then the next year it was double that. It was the first time that over a 1,000 African Americans were able to get on a ship and see the world together. It was absolutely stunning, and to arrange with the cruise companies to create cuisine that fit our black palates, you know, and, and to take us to regions that we never would have visited, and to be able to go together and to bring our culture there. It was just a, an amazing journey that Madeline really just invested so much time, energy, and effort, and her brain power in. And nothing more incredible than the evenings when we would all dress up in our cultural wear. Extraordinary moments and memorable times, times we'll just never forget that we cherish. They came to try to sharpen the cutting edge of black thought in America, to steer the civil rights fight in a new direction. It is not our objective now to ride on the front of the bus, but to buy the bus and drive it wherever we want to go. No other group had the kind of demographics that we had. So it became a phenomenon and a standard for a great many people who tried to replicate it and, and couldn't. But we never did it to make money, and we never did. <laughs> but we made history. And that really is to Madeline's credit, because each year, she would strive to make it better. And it was. You know, when you're building something in community, you want Madeline by your side. And I'll tell you, a magnificent thing happened when Sister Adelaide Sanford, one, one night I was having dinner with her, and I asked her how she was doing and what she needed, and she said, it's really a struggle maintaining Clark House. The John Henry Clark is a meeting house. Uh, it's a meeting house for people who've written books uh, about the culture and history and the economics of uh, African Americans. It's sort of a fertilizing area where people come and get ideas and take those ideas and move forward with them. Susan Taylor asked me at one of our meetings, uh, how's it going? And I said, oh, we're struggling with the mortgage. And she says, well, I don't want to see you struggle. We're going to raise the money to burn the mortgage. I called Madeline. Madeline entered and came up with an idea that just took it to the stratosphere. Madeline developed the idea of the quilt. Now, this quilt was made up of a group of separate patches. Anyone who gave over $2,500 would have his or her name or the name of the corporation on a quilt. A quilt that would hang in perpetuity at Clark House. And it was the funds from that quilt, from the people who bought the patches, that burnt the mortgage. She didn't say, well, I think this would be nice and see if we can get someone to do it. She said, this would be a wonderful idea and I'm going to do it. I was elected to be president of the New York Coalition of 100 Black Women. I reached out to the 100 Hispanic women and the Asian women in business. And so the three groups decided to form what was then called 
the world of women leaders. She had a vision for the coalition. She had a vision for Asian women. She had a vision for Hispanic women that we would all work together and it would make a difference. It was a camaraderie and a cultural blend that was unprecedented in New York. There were challenges. We were working out, uh, you know, how does one collaborate across cultures? But it was, again, a chance to use what I think I had been gifted with, which was my ability to create uh, structures uh, for women to collaboratively do something that empowered them. It was a wonderful idea to, to try to bring different groups together um, in a coalition. There's a lot more power there and a lot more opportunity really to make a difference. Ever since I've known Madeline, the, the number one passion she's had is mentoring. And through mentoring, you know, Madeline was helping individual women build their capacities, build their confidence, build their skills, and also be able to, to see themselves at the head of the table. Verizon gave us the building to use, and then First Lady Hillary Clinton came and she cut the ribbon. And it happened to be on my birthday that she cut the ribbon, so she sang me happy birthday. I happened to be uh, scheduled for a meeting at City Hall that morning. 9-11, uh, and I was on the phone standing at the window and my house was on the promenade in Brooklyn Heights. And so I'm on the phone talking to somebody at City Hall saying, I'm gonna be late for this meeting because I'm having a late start. And in the midst of that sentence, I said, my God, somebody's trying to land a plane on Hick Street. And the plane shook my house and I'm standing at the window and I saw it go into the World Trade Center. One of the outcomes for me was that I used that as a moment to reflect on my business, my life, and question whether or not I was living the life I wanted. And so I began then to look at legacy. What was my legacy going to be? And so I immediately changed the direction of my company to be legacy builders. That's when I was courted by um, AARP to be president of AARP for the state of New York. When I met Madeline, we hit it off from the beginning because we were on the same wavelength. We wanted to make a difference in the world. Madeline's leadership opened ARP to engage and include people of color. And that made such a difference in Albany because we were credible. We were an advocacy organization fighting for the rights of all people. What about the world do you think you're going to change? How are you going to influence the world that we have today? to make it even bigger and better tomorrow. You think that's possible? That would be a wonderful project. I was telling them earlier about uh, our family saying, what do I always tell you guys is our family saying to help? Help whenever you can, wherever you can, and whenever you can. Yeah. Oh, I like that. That's no, mm -hmm. sure, that's a joy. I was really stunned that Madeline and Tom had never met. I mean, two people in the same industry, two iconic leaders. Uh, I said, I'm going to introduce you two to each other. Didn't tell Tom that, but said it to Madeline. And just the time didn't present itself. So Tom called me out of the blue. We're talking about two or three years after Madeline and I had this conversation. So I said, well, uh, can you come tomorrow evening? And we sat here, right here in this living room, and we probably talked for, I don't know, four or five hours. I'm a little bit dense about people setting me up. Um, I didn't quite get it. By the time the evening was over, I thought maybe something was going on. I think it was four months later 
we were talking about marriage, being together for the rest of our lives. It was a spark that, you know, has sustained itself in wonderful ways. When you know something, then you know it. And I felt I was old enough and she was old enough to know what it was that we, were, we had here. When uh, I told my son I was going to marry Tom Morell, who I had just met four months prior, he said, Mom, is something wrong with him? Does he have some disease? So Tom told him, yeah, it's called aging. <laughs> He's a wonderful man, and it's such a blessing to be able to have someone who cares so much for my mother in the way that I know she cares for him. What are you doing? the rest of your life, north and south and east and west of your life. I wasn't just at the wedding, I was the matron of honor. Oh my gosh, that was so wonderful to see Tom's mother there and, you know, both their families. I gave my sister away, which was a proud moment for me and to give him away like a fine gentleman like Tom, so I felt good about that. I'd have to say it was the first wedding I have ever been to, friends or family or anybody, that I was so touched. It all happened very quickly. And as any son would be, I was, I had a bit of trepidation about, you know, her suddenly meeting someone and then, wait, you're going, where, you're moving to Chicago. Why would you, you live in New York. Why would you move to the Midwest? It was a very courageous move. It was such a gesture of love and trust. I'm, I'm just grateful. There is a kindred spirit there that resides uh, between us that allows a very safe place to, to say your what ifs and, uh, you know, play. They're both looking to offer the world the same thing, but they're doing it in different shapes and different forms. And when they come together, those two forms kind of meet and lock perfectly. And it's like they're offering this really beautiful thing in their relationship, both of them being known for being inspirational. But when they're coming together, that inspiration is just multiplied so much so. Madeline came up the hard way. She didn't have anything when she started. And she never forgot how tough it was at the beginning. And you could succeed through a pathway of honor. Madeline has always been a catalyst and a cause factor. So her ability to participate in different organizations, speak to who she is as a person, and what her legacy is, and what it is that she intends. I am very fortunate to have Madeline in my circle of souls, in my life, because she lifts me to a higher purpose. And she brings with her, her energy, which is so positive that there's so much joy, inspiration, and love. It's difficult for me to verbalize a single quality that I admire most in Medellin. But if I had to, if you pushed me to it, I would say resilience uh, and the capacity to bounce back, the capacity to love, the capacity to embrace. You've done so good. You've come so far. Like a bright and shining star you are Strong and still glowing Grown and still growing Madeline, you know you raised the bar So good so far